is the dangers of cinema, film and moral discourse of the late Muslim Empire. And our speaker, uh, Dr. Uste Chalik Tamil Tolman, will be speaking. Just to say that, that, that in fact, um, Uste is, as it were, really an international scholar already, even though she's come to the beginning of her career. She's uh, uh, conducted her doctoral research is here at UCL, and she's now at Boisachi. Um, and then before that, she studied at Boisachi, and she's now at Optu. And as well, I think you just you also studied in, in the in the European yes. University as well. Absolutely. Well, there we are. So yeah. um, that's really uh, congratulations on such a promising start. But now we are simply going to hear a talk on the dangers of cinema. So thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'd like to first start thanking Dr. Shockman and also Anglo Turkish Society all for coming here this evening. <laughs> and also our host, Royal Anthropological Institute, too. So, yes, dangers of cinema, films, and moral discourse in the late Ottoman Empire. I did my PhD research at UCL, uh, but the topic I studied there was regulation of cinema, so censorship of films. How, what kind of films were banned, which kind of film content made officials anxious. So I studied those. So here I chose to just focus on the morality and film content. It's not chiefly based on my PhD. I did some additional work on it and I am going to present some new findings tonight as well. Yes, this is a quite a controversial topic but um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the start of the cinema and how it developed in the empire. Just a quick context maybe, like in 1896 when it was invented, mainly the cinematograph by Lumiere Brothers or Edison's Kinetoscope or Skandinavsky Brothers' Bioscope in Germany, it was shortly after was available in the Ottoman lands mainly the urban centers, Istanbul, Thessalonica, Beirut, Damascus, Anatolia. So all these traveling operators visited Ottoman lands, showed their films, wanted to sell their films and the projectors to the Ottomans. So Ottoman merchants were also interested in this. Um, there's a quite history there, but um, I'm not going to go into details, otherwise I won't be able to tell you what was the dangers of cinema for those. But here, um, I'm going to specifically talk about the war years, First World War years. Um, so it's not the pre-cinema or early years of cinema, but mainly 1910s and 20s, right before modern Turkey. And yes, it's the period when we had all these change of political powers, from Sultan Abdullah Abdul Hamid II to the Union of Progress, and then to other different sultans and occupation years in Istanbul, so on and so forth. And my main sources are from Prime Minister Ottoman Archives. So this is basically the view from Istanbul. Of course, there are sources at the archives in Istanbul from provinces. Uh, we'll talk about the details. Um, but as I said, it's official recounts, accounts, and as well as I'll show you a few silent films that Ottomans made and which are related to this morality, immorality, the question of uh, concerns. So, um, uh, in May 1918, author Refik Halid wrote a piece entitled Troubling Cinema, Cinema Derdi, for a journal called Yeni Mejma. Refik Halid set his pen to paper and claimed that cinema muddied our blood. Films profaned women and children like the dirty underwear of the West. The whole question of obscenity in Refik Haydn's piece reveals concerns within the late Ottoman spectacle culture by emphasizing morality and danger supposedly found in films. In this piece, Refik Haydn argues that women imitate the actors they see in films and children learn theft from films and they watch half-naked men and half-naked women flirting with each other. So, Refik Haid advocated that in a society where sexuality is a taboo and was thought of as cautious and secretive, the screening of immoral films was incorrect. He felt that the bad role 
models in films would produce negative effects in Ottoman society. He feared that vulnerable audiences would mistake representations for reality in films. At the same time, he claimed that cinema at times was useful and informative, but these days it was immoral. And I asked, was this simply due to the conflicting state of mind or the unregulated cinema atmosphere during the war years? Or that cinema was, at times, both things, useful and dangerous. So this is a piece from the Yeni Cinema, and you see if you call it. Here is the one part of his uh, article. Uh, I'm not going to read it all, but I think uh, this part that I will quote is interesting. So he says, now we are watching leftover films from the West that have been discarded from every other country, but sent to us as if they are something dear. We let our children watch all those films. It's a shame to expose our families every day to the dirty underwear of the West. So these lines may appear to be very judgmental <laughs> to some of you, maybe not. This is what, this is what he wrote in 19. 18. So Refik Halid's concerns are significant to follow because they are part of the broader discursive view of the Ottoman dominant class. He was particularly anxious about the use of obscenity in films and its effects on women and children. As an influential intellectual, intellectual of the time, he wanted to share his ideas with his readers in Yen Mejma. So, this talk is about the discourses and practices of the Ottoman dominant class, namely bureaucrats, elite, and intellectuals, over children and women audiences, and their cinema going at various film exhibition venues, because films were not only available at theaters, they were screened at schools, open air cinemas, gardens, museums, coffee houses, kravatanes. So there are various types of film exhibition venues. And the member of this particular class either had the power to change the sociocultural policies or the influence to affect the regulations by providing an ideological framework. I will elaborate a number of important archival documents that portray the concerns of immorality found in films, such as violence, crime, and obscenity. And firstly, my goal is to explore the criticisms of film content and exhibition venues in relation to the children audiences, Secondly, I will take into account is the women's cinema going and restrictions over women audiences that were imposed by Islamic law, religious and moral obligations, and the reshaping of gender roles in the late Ottoman context. So, shortly I suggest I will suggest that discourses and practices about children and women audiences were at times protective or patronizing. And at times, their ideas were very elitist. Both those sets of characteristics are similar. An Ottoman elite sought to protect and educate, and sometimes practices show divergence. Let's now focus on the first part, which is danger of spectacles. Um, so. Ideologies of Islamism, Turkism, Westernism, all form the concept of morality in different ways in Ottoman society. So how was morality seen, right? We ask these questions to ourselves. So based on these ideologies, morality was seen identical to Islamic thought, stemmed from the holy book of Quran and Prophet Muhammad's saints. This was the official ideology. And morality was also described within national values, education, and emphasizing Turkishness, especially during the First World War. Or morality was redefined in relation to Western values, because some people adapted themselves to the Western wars, started living like a la Franga lifestyle in contrast to a la Turca. And that's why the question of morality especially became a hot topic after the spread of Western European films, the cinema. Did other forms of art and spectacles contain anything dangerous and immoral during this time period? So I'm going to talk about cinema, but let's see if other types of performances or spectacles had this type of concern or anxiety. Um, apart from cinema, dangers of artism 
reflected in photography and ephemera, had a relatively devoted customer base in Istanbul. Erotic stories became very popular in late autumn era, and as Fatma Turek says, starting with 1908 up to the late 1920s, these stories, erotic stories, were published uncensored. And in Ottoman shadow theater, Karagöz, obscenity and indecent jokes were common, and even the phallus of puppet characters was shown on stage sporadically. Karagöz represented intimacy by staging stories that took place in hammams, recreational areas, or even brothels. In other words, the rule of nudity and visibility of men and women in intimacy was explicitly expressed on the curtain of Karagöz's shadow play. Furthermore, Ahmed Rasim indicates that traditional performing arts, both Ortoyun and Karagöz, often represented obscenity in a word, act, and expression on the stage. This is one of the illustrations of Salih Erimaz. It's from 1941, but Erimaz has a few albums, like five or six of them, that he began to publish in the 40s. This was made in 1941, and it's a scene, as you can see, this is a coffee store, coffee shop, and the Karagöz show is only here for men audience. So, um, uh, sorry, would, would that have been a picture of how things were in 1941? No, he's no. restored. Yeah, it's before, of course. Yeah. It, thank you for this question. He did it in 1941, but he's reflecting previous years. Of course, it's not. As we talk about 20s and 1910s. So, um, let me continue. So, Ahmed Rasim, uh, as I said, uh, indicates that both Ortoyun and Karagöz, all these often represented obscenity. And Dror Zevi, the historian of performing arts, notes that from the end of 19th century, political authorities began to control the use of sex and sexuality in shadow theater, other genres, and areas. He says they were either transformed into almost sterile genres in which sex and sexuality are seldom discussed. The state justified its intervention within the discourse of morals, danger of prostitution, and contagious disease. And the same can be observed in the production and sales of photography, and ephemera, and exhibition and production of films. So state began to ban certain films. But as long as the devoted customs of obscenity existed, it appears that the screenings and local productions attempt to serve the audience's demand. So how was cinema integrated to this discourse on obscenity? What constituted obscenity in film and which exhibitions were banned? So while there are no detailed reports on the content of films describing what erotism meant at the time, Ottoman officials found certain films obscene and immoral based on the Islamic law and moral values. In the catalog of Patefer, the initial films containing erotism in Western Europe dates back to 1902. For instance, the scenes of an erotic character of 1902, the sleeping Parisian lady of 1904, were the early examples of this genre. And these films did not show actual intercourse, yet they contain seductive elements to arouse the male audience. Also, Edison's films like Subret's Travels on a Fifth Avenue Stage and What Happened to What Happened on 23rd Street were all available in mainly Istanbul and other urban centers of the Ottoman cities. So for the Ottoman audiences, depictions and dialogue from Hussein Rahmi Gülpınar's story entitled Forbidden for Children, Çocukları Yasak, gives a glimpse of what could potentially be seen in these productions, and I will talk about its details in the second part of my talk. Since most of these films were imported into the empire, and they were all from productions, Ottomans might have been exposed to these scenes as well. And Clarence Richard Johnson's report indicates that cinema houses of Istanbul, 
screened suggestive and immoral films that were from US, France, Italy, and Germany. It notes that these cheap and sensational films wouldn't have been allowed in America or England. Similar to Rafi Khalid's concerns that I referred at the beginning, Johnson's report concludes that a board of censors should be formed to eliminate immoral scenes from films, implying that there was no preview committee at the time, or officers investigating the film's content. In these years, Cinema Enterprise aimed to make profit by promoting Blue Nights or Black Nights. These were the names of the film screenings in which these type of films were shown. So, Ministry of Interior in 1910 began enforcing the preview of films, yet in practice they were not successful. And according to the 1916 draft regulation, scenes contrary to chastity and decency were forbidden, and in practice we don't really know if they follow the regulations. Let me give an example. In 1908, the Odeon Theater in Istanbul's Bayo district screened inappropriate and immoral films, even though the institution had been warned by censor officers before. Previously, the governor of Beyoğlu, Mutasarif, banned the theater from screening this type of obscene films several times, and special attention was paid to certain venues, including this Odeon theater. Along with Odeon, other Beyoğlu cinema theaters continued screening erotic films in the following years, and theater owners still had the ability to slip them into their program discreetly. So even though there was banning and investigations, they kept screening those films. This is a photo enlargement from daily newspaper Tanin, dating back to 1908. And in this newspaper, the headline was Immorality of Cinematograph. So, Tanin claimed that the imperative to make profit seemed to have pushed some of the cinema owners into showing risk films. Like Johnson's report noted, these profit-seeking cinema owners chose to project immorality on the screen. So again, in 1908, at Odeon Theatre, after the main program, a special show entitled Moving Blue Films was screened to the audiences, and the audiences was a mixed group with children, women, men, adults and children mixed. But moving blue films indicates erotic films, so there was no warning before the film screening. So Tanin reports that these films were especially unsuitable for women and children, but they were profitable for the theater, so they screened them. So particularly adult male audiences were the loyal customers, and due to the content, women, most of the time, would leave the venue. To, they would leave the audience. But children from different age groups would remain and watch the films until the end. Furthermore, Tanin claims that it was the task of the moral press, like itself, Tanin, <laughs> to publicly inform the police and family members about the obscenity of films at Odeon Theater. So the newspaper additionally noted that the police should locate these types of incidents and prevent the public exhibition. Um, yes, let's look at uh, other types of activities, spectacles, especially in Istanbul. So this is from an image of nightlife in Istanbul during the war years. As you can see, there is a dancer on the right hand side and on the left hand side there is a band playing music and on the front you see the different types of customers. So, in addition to erotic films, other physical performances were included in the program during the film exhibition. So films were exhibited along with musical shows, performances or Karagos Shadow Theater because most of the films at the time were really short. So they wouldn't make only one program. There wasn't feature-length films were not very common at the time. So, for instance, Zafar Toprak notes that during the first World War years, Milli Cinema in Istanbul organized variety shows before film exhibitions, wherein half-naked Russian girls 
perform dance shows on the stage. And so this is one of the, the typical image of a dancer singer. And Zafar Toprak adds that these shows were in high demand and that audiences would wait for them in long queues in front of Milisna. Uh, this is one of the non-Muslim European one. I think she's German, as Alexandrov's website gives the details. And this is another one, a well-known Kantoju, dancer and singer. Again, this is depicted in the 1910s and 20s, even though it was printed in 1945 by Sadi Elimas. So, let's move on. I'll give you a few examples from the films as well. So, Ottomans made their own films as well, but it's not even like 10 or 12 films. Uh, there is no national film archive in Turkey, so we don't really know how many films Ottomans made at the time. We don't have the exact filmography. And they were mostly active during First World War years. They did wartime films, but also there are fictions that I'm going to specifically talk about this evening. This is one of the examples, which is related to our topic, danger of cinema. So, while certain control and strategies were practiced and proposed, the obscenity in films was also available for audiences in autumn productions. This was directed by Ahmed Fahim, another actor. He also directed this film called Binnas. Um, it was shot in 1919 by the semi-charity institution called Mari Gazler Cemiyeti, the Disabled Veterans Society. And this cinematographer is Fuat Uskunay. And here we see Binnas kissing his lover, Efe Ahmed. And on the other side, on the right hand side, I will show you the film. But they are having a fight. So this is from Mimar Sinan University Cinema and TV Library. And the originals are located at Turkish Armed Forces Photo Film Center in Ankara. So in this film, Binnas is about an Ottoman prostitute or courtesan of the same name. She has a high clientele and she is a seductive and playful woman in the film. But she's troubled by having two love affairs. It was based on the play of Yusufia or Touch. And the voyeuristic male gaze, artism of female beauty, and the secretive kiss, as you can see, pushes the limits of obscenity in this Ottoman production. Let's move on to the second film, and then I will play them. This is the second example, again, of Ahmed Fahim, the governess, Murebiye. They are from the same archives. This is a film enlargement, and in the middle you see Turkish Armed Forces logo. On the left, we see the governess, French governess, Angèle. On the right-hand side, there is Dehri Efendi, who lives in an Ottoman mansion. He is the patriarch of an Ottoman mansion. And the film, in the film, Angèle is described as a femme fatale, and she's got multiple lovers. Uh, she's having love affairs with Turkish Muslim men at this Ottoman mansion. And this film also shows that local productions also challenge the issue of immorality. So there are uh, five different heroes in this um, film, all male, and they're all interested in French governess, and they're having a relationship, they're flirting with her. And this is an adaptation from Hussein Rami Gripner's novel of the same name. Uh, so, given the fact that there were three fictions made until 1919 in the Ottoman Empire, these are quite interesting films, mainly trying to teach audience um, the difference between morality and immorality. They, were, they aim to teach them lessons by showing these type of stories, like you see, Rani Buchner did try in his novel. And these producers of both films, Binaz and Governess, 
was, as I said, a semi-official institution called the Society of Disabled Veterans. And Ottoman authorities didn't seem to question the obscenity in either Binas or the governments. I'm trying to play it, but I'll be right back. These are very short, silent films. Let's see. This is from, again, we were seeing we see Binaz and Faika Hanum dancing, entertaining their customers, uh, mainly male audience. This is really short. This is the interior of her room. She's having drinks, and Faika, her assistant, is helping her. And in a minute, we will see that Efe Ahmed will join them. I'm sorry, the quality is really bad, but this is what I have now. As you can see, she heard that Efe Ahmed is about to come, so she got worried. She actually doesn't want to talk to him. Here, as it's silent, we don't have the intertitles, titles. I can't make any guess, but I read Yusuf Ziyar type's text, and it's not really following the play, but we can tell at least they're having an argument. And as you can see, the way she's nodding her head, and now she's having a tough time, I guess. She's um, also an actress, Armenian, originally, Armenian <coughs> Ottoman. Yes. And here is the kiss. And she's expecting her other lover, Hamza. As you can see, it's very theatrical, and the camera is not focusing on all of them, three of them at the same time. It's a close-up. And this is the early years of filmmaking, so these cinematographers and directors are not really experienced. They are mainly performing on stage. I think it's replaying it, is it? So, now she learns that her other lover is about to arrive, so she begs him to go, to leave. Okay, they managed to make him go. <laughs> now she's going to play her. I think this scene is very sweet. She's acting as if nothing happened. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the second one. Oh. So here we see French governess Murebia Angel in her room. As I said, at the mansion, Ottoman mansion, all these male heroes are interested in her and they're flirting with her. This is uh, the uncle of the household, Sabri Bey. As you can see, she's very uh, short with him. This is night time, of course. Everyone is sleeping. And here we see the youngest son of the household, named Semi. She's, he's, he's passionately in love. This is his first love, so... and. As you can see, he's asking her something. She's holding a key, we will see, in her hand. And they all fell on the floor. It's, she's go, he's going to take the key. And on the left, you see a wardrobe. And he's going to unlock it. And here is the time of crisis. You can't believe in his eyes. He faints. 
and on shelf fans, and that's the <laughs> father of the household. So he was also having an affair with her. Again, she's getting undressed. This was from, <laughs> yes, I'll explain. Let's move on to the second one. Um, so Did different they have from uh, subtitles, not subtitles, um, but um, words, as in on the whole side of the films had in Western countries. Exactly, yes. They had, they had these plates which they would put in front of the film. So for the autumn production, I'm not sure how they did. It's silent, of course, but they would put the plates for the foreign productions, foreign films. Otherwise, if they did, don't have it, someone before the film screening would come up to the stage and read the story, give some details, narrate how it is. And during break times, they would again give an explanation. It was, yes, silent. Some of them had intertitles. And this film, Governess, as I couldn't find the original one, um, I took this part from a documentary called Siah Perde. That's why you saw that pink man closing down the curtain. So it's from Beige Ox Siah Perde, which tells the story of censorship. So governess is also known for, some of the cinema historians consider it as the first censored film in the history of cinema in the region, which is incorrect. Uh, that's why it was included in this documentary. But for the sake of this talk, I included it because of the aim of the film, which was to teach audience that a la Turca lifestyle should be practiced instead of an Alafranga one. If you go to Prime Minister Ottoman archives, there are files about Mrebiyes, governors living in the Ottoman Empire, how complaints were piled up. So some of the advoca advocators of Islamic lifestyle or conservative lifestyle were against hiring foreign governors in their households, and this uh, film is representing that actually, and Hussein Rahmi Yurkunar also tried to do it in his novel. Okay, how are we doing with the time? Um, I have two other parts, and go ahead. You have you have time. Good, good. So children and cinema. Uh, I will briefly provide a context because what we call children in the 21st century is different than the late Ottoman era. So. Exploring the notion of childhood within the political agenda of Ottoman society may be useful. So during the second constitutional period, which is started from 1908, the Union and Progress, the party, aimed at creating the national generation that was patriotic and loyal to state. And Gürkan Öztan writes that Ottoman children became the hope and future not only for the family, but for the state during these years in 1910s and 20s. Children were considered as the potential citizen, entrepreneur, and soldier. This political expectation also affected the national pedagogy and training at schools and instructors' rhetoric in children's books and magazines. The emphasis on national values and national generation were the common themes in children's publications which match the policies of the Union and Progress. In children's magazines, cinema's modernity, the films, were represented as the technological wonder, and the films began to serve as a propaganda tool to shape children's minds accordingly, especially during the war times, First World War. For instance, the magazine Çocuk Duygusu announced that cinema news by referring to the images of the Ottoman soldiers in films from the battlefields in order to consolidate the feeling of past and descendants who fought for their empire. So Ottomans were also making films during the First World War and in Çocuk Duygusu they were showing the enlargements of the films for the children readers. So this is a short background but let's see in relation to cinema how it was perceived. In December 1896, when cinema reached the Ottoman lands, no legal restrictions seemed to in place to limit the age of the Ottoman audiences. 
young people were certain audiences, such as the authors. On the left, we see Arjunat Ekrem Tolu, and on the right, Refi Khalid, who were eight and 10 years of age, respectively, when they watched their first film. Indeed, schools such as Galatasaray High School, Mektib Sultani, and others were used as venues for early film exhibitions. According to Ottoman society, the definition of childhood varies based on a number of different criteria. And in a multi ethnic and multi religious setting, where 12 and 13 year old children were able to marry, understanding children's cinema going is kind of problematic. In addition, for an empire which extended from an Arabian Peninsula and Balkan, Balkans to Anatolia, it is impossible to suggest a linear childhood image. And we don't have a single approach to define what a child meant at the time. So there were different views about children's cinema going among different social groups, and I will give you details on this. So this is again an illustration from Salih Irmaz showing us a Ramadan night in Şehzadebaşı district of Istanbul, um, which is mostly a residential area for the Muslim population. And in this illustration, we can see two kids, one on the left-hand side, as you can see, and one here on the very right side, and also adults with mixed men and women at a night time. And in this illustration, we see the spectacles of the time. On the very left hand, uh, there is Karagos uh, advertisement. In the middle, under the flags, it's cinematograph, and we see one, two, three, those are the names of the films. And in the very middle, in the middle, the biggest sign is for um, theat theatrical performance of Komiki Şehir Hasan Efendi. So, in a Ramadan night, audiences will be able to watch all these on the stage, along with the films. And children would attend it, along with the adults. So, children would find entertainment by watching Karagöz, comedy shows, Medda, and apart from films. So, and these types of performances, as I indicated at the beginning, would have obscenity, even though it would be a Ramadan night. So, let's see another illustration. This is from Caricatures of Karagöz of 1909. On the left-hand side, we see the customers at a tavern. And then here, there's a father with his two kids. So, according to social norms, adults would accompany children to screenings. And as a matter of fact, as seen from this description of Karagos, children going to film exhibitions would instead find themselves in a tavern, in place of cinema house. This illustration, in this one, adults consuming alcohol are depicted opposite a father accompanying his children to the venue. And the dialogue follows. Father says, hi brothers, it's my misfortune. Theaters are closed down. We were going to cinema. As I'm here, I should get juiced up, and then I can go home. Kids, kiss your uncle, he says. And uncle, how come? What if the kids spill the beans, he asks. Father, oh my dear, they're kids. What would they know? Let them sit downstairs. Come on. So in an environment like this, children would be present. Of course, this is a caricature from Karagos, but it reflects some of the reality of the time. So aside from cinema houses, various venues such as pubs and cafes exhibited obscenity in variety shows, dance and musicals, as I said. And these shows were advertised as Blue Nights and Black Nights. And Hussein Rahmi Gürpınar's uh, story called Forbidden for Children, Çocuklar Yasak of 1908, is a depiction of this. So the story gives some hints about the customers as it recounts the content of the films and criticizing the adult audience. So this is the book cover, but there are multiple stories in the book. And here I focus on Çocuklar Yasak. And 
Forbidden for Children tells a series of events that starts with a child going to watch a film with his father. But he ends up with men watching a film presenting naked women, nudity. A child's mother sees his son coming back home without his father in the story. And mother learns that shameful things were screened during the film exhibition. And in this story, the child is portrayed as a vulnerable character who s s tries to stay out of the world of the adults. And the mother is a symbol of morals, decency, and chastity in this story. And there are two main men adult characters in this story. And one of them, they both go to the film screening and one of them refuses to admit that he saw what was shown on the screen and the other one, the second one, seeing the disappointment that he caused his wife explains the content of the film so he says in the story a woman strips on screen and enters the bath a man watches her over the curtain and the wife is about to faint and asks did you watch it? she asks to her husband and husband replies, of course. And then she says, you should be ashamed. Of course, this is a story from Hussein Rahmi Gürtnar, but it emphasizes the need to protect children by keeping them out from eroticism that was reflected in the films at the time. This produces a family crisis for the men in the story because they're peeping into someone else's privacy in the film. And with this story, Hussein Rahmi questions the nudity in relation to morality and films. Let's see, what was the age limit? As I said, was there an age limit? Um, ben Arjunat Ekrem was 10 years old. He went to this pub called Sponic Pub on Galatasaray, and he was able to watch films. The same for Rifik Halit, but when cinemas became more available, the concerns became higher and higher, so 16 year age limit, let's say. So, children saw scenes of violence and murder in films, and it's reported in the 1916 correspondence between Istanbul, police, governorship, and Ministry of Interior. It, the report reads that children were watching violent scenes of murder in the films and crime in the films. And according to the legislators, precautions should have been taken, but there were no laws in those years. So archival records show that authorities recommended that children under 16 years of age not go to cinema houses. And this happened in 1916. So they wanted to pass an enforcement, but we're not sure if it passed or not and if it was practiced or not. So officials thought that children watching these murder scenes in the films would become depressed, develop psychological problems, or just merely become immoral. So they were concerned because of these justifications. And there was a belief that children would attempt to commit those violent So it is possible that regulations in 1916, disseminated by the Istanbul governor and policies, could have prevent prevented children from going to cinema in some cases. And these organizations also took action based on complaints from public. So people were complaining about it too. They supported the showing of films which were educational and improved children's psychological development and education. But the politics of cinema regulations were directly shaped by the complaints of the audiences and like the newspapers of Tanin and others. So in the light of this, we can now consider Rafik Halit's Troubling Cinema, Cinema Dare, the article. As it said, the dirty underwear of the West. So, he explained the discomfort felt when exposed to uncensored obscene films like the crime scenes, murder scenes, and nudity. Um, let's move on to the last part of the talk, which is women and cinema. So the already existing socially constructed gender roles affected women's cinema going, starting from the 1896 when cinema was available in the empire. Ottoman social institutions and entertainment venues generally 
segregated genders. So men and women attended theatrical performances separately. And most of the venues exhibiting films functioned in this way during the late autumn years. And in urban settings like in Istanbul, Izmir, Thessalonica, Trabzon, matinees were exclusively for women. Public venues carried out mixed gender exhibitions in a variety of, way, of ways and having women seated behind men, women would be in, on the front and men would be in the back. Or there would be a screen between the two or a curtain. And this was a regular practice among Muslim Ottomans. And it did vary based on age, class, religion, ethnicity, and education. But women's attendance of spectacles prior to cinema was subject to debate among intellectuals, politicians, and as well as public. According to an influential author, Ahmed Rasim, there was always turmoil regarding the life of Muslim women. During the Hamidian era, Abdul Hamid II, there was strict control of women. At times, the afternoon and evening promenades were prohibited for women during the religious month of Ramadan, or other times going to shops in Beyoğlu, Bazaar, or Bon Marche was forbidden. And despite this, at various secluded shows, women were freely allowed to watch all sorts of shameful things presented during the performances, like here, Ahmed Rasim says, I'll quote, he, his text skillfully describes the conditions of women here. Whether freely or strictly, women in our society have carefully crafted their own womanhood. They took the initiative to direct their lives, yet they faced a surprising array of interference. And now, women are subject to the evil and distressful subject found in Karagos, puppet shows, and Ortoyo, and similar things on stage like European theater. But women are always subject to obligations of morality, he says, in 1926. So he re-evaluates the years of Hamidin year and Young Turk period. But Ottoman women who had access to certain high and middle class venues could watch films during the late early years of cinema. And women watched films at private houses, gardens, and public and commercial venues too. Some cinema houses organized daytime exhibitions for children and women and evenings for men. And here, author Samet Muhtar Olus talks about one of his memories. Even though it was published, republished in 2001, he is talking about the 20s here. Let's see what he says. On a Tuesday years ago, we took a 40-year-old slave woman to the theater at Shevki Zambolu's garden. She was sharp and curious about everything. After the doors, chimneys, and windows were closed, and images of people running appeared on the lit curtain, the poor lady nearly left from the box beseeching, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. So frightened was she that her stomach became upset as she begged, oh, give me some soda. Which way is out from this pitch darkness? Helpless, she closed her eyes and prayed fervently until the roaring and cracking of the projector stopped and fasted the following three days. So for a 40-year-old woman, this was her first experience at a garden, and she watched the film in this way. She thought it was a sinful experience, and she was shocked. So based on this, let's magnify the issue of segregation during the film exhibitions between men and women. So there are a few conflicting testimonials depicting women's cinema going. Like Alus, he writes that the first mixed gender public film exhibition took place in Military Museum, Askeri Museum, Istanbul. He describes the screen hall as follows, women at the back, men on the front, and the screen between them. Another account of Veshad Ekrem Koçu, he says, Alemdar cinema in Istanbul housed the first mixed gender exhibition, but the, again, venue was divided into by a screen and women seated on the one side, men seated on the other side. Whereas Jimmy Filmer claims that the first mixed gender public film exhibition was organized at Ankara cinema during the Republican years. 
and Gunnar Dönmez Kolin assumes that cinema going was exclusively open to men, so she assumes that Ottoman Muslim women uh, were in a position in which they couldn't see films at all during the late Ottoman era. So if you look at secondary sources, they're all conflicting, uh, but my findings are, on the contrary, saying that they were able to see films. And trying to find out the, which one was the first film screening that women and men were mixed gender is inevitable to find because there isn't enough memoirs to, to follow that. So, let me open a parenthesis here to show how women were active and visible in everyday life, especially during the second constitutional era. So, trans transformation during the second constitutional era led to the changes in socially constructed roles and opening of new jobs for women, especially in the war years. After the Young Turk Revolution in 1908, various associations were founded with the aim of promoting females and intellectuals demanded equality, equality between males and females. So, during the First World War, Ottoman women began to gain visibility in the public sphere. For instance, the Islamic League of Working Women, Kadınları Çalıştırma Cemiyeti, İslamiyesi, was established in 1916 under the auspices of Enver Pasha and his wife Naciye Sultan. So Ottoman women could work as barbers, factory workers, and some of them served in women workers' battalions, namely Kadın İşçi Tabuları. So women were actively um, serving society, and the war years also witnessed a number of radical ruptures about the inequality between women and men. So within this uh, atmosphere, liberation movement, women began to act in contrast to norms and customs. So this was a new life, a period of new life, to overcome the barriers caused by religious affiliation and gender roles. So Muslim women actively attempted to break existing gender discrimination. So we can say that elite, at least, at least elite Ottoman women participated in film exhibitions, for instance, as I talked about the governess, Murebiye, um, in 1919, Marun Gaziler Cemiyeti Cinema Film Fabrikası, Disabled Veteran Cinema Factory, organized its gala in Istanbul. And among the guests were the director of the institution, the author of the novel, Hüseyin Rahmi, and also prominent ladies were available, were present at the gala. So they watched films together, all together, without a segregation. If I go back to Jenny Filmer's account, his claim that Muslim Ottoman women waited until the Republican period to go to cinema was likely incorrect. So Ottoman women began to be active in social, economic, political, and cultural life prior to the establishment of the Republic of Turkey and benefiting from films and other technical, technological innovations of the time. And visibility for women in the public sphere was associated with factors such as class, wealth, and education. So watching films in public was more accessible for elite women and reflected social inequalities of the time. So for the women from lower cl classes, maybe it was not likely in so. But based on ticket prices and seating, seating arrangements in the cinema theaters, uh, we know that women from the lower classes would buy cheaper t tickets and attend films screenings. Let's see other, other types of ideologies about how intellectuals such as Hadi Edip think about women's cinema going. So, uh, in her essay called Bir Mukayese, an analogy, Hadi Edip estimates women's transformation by comparing and contrasting between East and West. Her essay is similar to other intellectuals' opinions, like Rafi Khalid, in the way that they refer to, in a way, binary oppositions. She categorizes cinema as only for entertainment and pleasure, and rejecting the idea that cinema could have any, any educational purpose. She also divides women into two categories in this article, 
saying that those who are stunning and those who are ignored divide women into two categories. She thinks that stunning women are serious, realistic, and they attend educational gatherings, meetings, science clubs, while ignored women attend film screens, plays, or they, they do promenade, promenade around Bayol. So her view is kind of contrasting, of course, but this belief is in a way reflecting the intellectual's idea about cinema. Cinema was seen inferior, and most of the films during the war years, as the reports call, were cheap and sensational. So, highly edited soul cinema is an empty type of entertainment, especially in those years. She believed that ignored women dirty the pure Turkish womanhood. That's what she writes in Bir in 1922. So most of the dominant intellectual discourse considered women as the figure to represent the empire itself and its wealth, glory, or survival and honor of the empire. So women were symbolized by these concepts. And highly edited, that's why, argued that government and press should reform ignorant women who go to the movies. They should be educated. And likewise, Rafiq Khalid also agreed with her, and they wanted to have a reformation for women's education. So Rafiq Khalid made clear when he stated, like, after all the work that we've made to raise up women in this country, cinema comes along to tear it down as it has been going on. So Khalid's view is similar to Rafiq Khalid, and there are some other examples from intellectuals all the time. Let me give you some more examples from provinces, as these were mostly from urban centers, Istanbul and intellectuals of the time. This historical account is an interesting one. So I titled it as Cinematograph Exclusively for Women. So several petitions and complaints sent to Istanbul from provinces called for the banning of Muslim women attending the cinema, watching films, because it was considered against Islamic law and customs of society. For instance, a group of Muslim men from Izmir, conservatives, sent a petition to the provincial governor in 1912, arguing for a provision of women's cinema going. According to the local Ahenk newspaper in Izmir, the petition was signed by 600 people. Even if this did not change the official policy because there was no banning of women's cinema going, it shows that there was some support among certain groups for this type of ban related to women's audiences. Another case is from Beirut, dating back 1913. The ulema and elite from Beirut sent several telegraphs to the Minister of Interior in Istanbul, Dahiliye Nezareti, on the same issue like in Izmir. The petition from Beirut is a historically significant one. It is at the same time a complaint about the administration of Beirut, governor of Beirut, Etembe. It mentions that the governor himself allowed for chaste, honorable Muslim women to watch films. It says that cinema houses are sinister, wild, coarse entertainments, similar to taverns and brothels, and cinema houses are against Sharia law, Sharia, and Islam. Five minutes. Thank you. So Ulema asked that Ministry of Interior ban Muslims, especially women, from going to these type of film exhibitions. Uh, but Governor Etambe, under pressure from this international group, sent a telegraph of his own explaining the situation, and he wrote that the complaints or objections, objections were not through because the first film exhibition was organized exclusively for women in Beirut. So there was no segregation, there was no need because it was only for women. 
So the answer received from the Minister of Interior sided with the governor by stating that there is no issue with women attending film exhibitions. So this historical case from Beirut highlights the contestations over cinema between the liberals and conservatives in an ultimate province, Beirut. The highest authority in the province, situated far from the center of the empire, arranged women-only film exhibitions. But the upper conservative segments in the city felt that women's cinema going was against Islamic law and customs. So what is important here is the center's response from the Minister of Interior. There is no obstacle to women watching films. This is again another illustration that I found in Saeed Eriman's book. And it describes the film screens of 1910s and 20s. As you can see, it's only for women. And there is a ch child there. And we see the operator in the middle. And the, on the curtain, there are three characters. And on the top, you see the Ottoman Turkish advertisements of the films. Let me conclude. So, a review of complaints and petitions of the Ottoman dominant class shows that there were shared concerns regarding cinema going of children and women during the late Ottoman era. Discourses and practices about children and women audiences were at times protectionist and patronizing, and at times elitist. Intellectuals' writings represented a stereotypical Western image from the films imported from Western Europe and North America which included such themes as erotism, crime, and violence. This idea claimed that Western mores represented in films contaminated particularly children and women. Political authorities were also concerned that films and the environment of the exhibition rooms were a threat to children. The way that Ottoman dominant class perceived cinema was certainly affected by the political and sociocultural atmosphere of the time, highlighted by patriotic commitment, social despair, and a heightened sense of fear of potential enemies during the war years, and the transitional years from an empire to a number of nation states. So the concerns and social tens tensions regarding cinema were complex, as I indicated, and Ottoman officials' objective to regulate cinema going and to censor certain films were affected by the time of the more. I think this is the end of my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that absolutely fascinating lecture. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. What we normally see now is if you need a glass of wine, I think they come very, very quickly. Well, any questions? Uh, before people can. Think about their questions. <laughs> so hold on, let's get a bottle of wine from the fridge. How did I get the word around that there was a Caracosa arranged for certain evenings. How did the word how did the word get around to the public? The Is film screenings. Any? Yeah. Newspapers and they would also have ad uh, advertisements um, on the posters oh. on the walls. And also they would like newspaper sellers in the streets, mm. they would go out and say, Black Knights, Pound Blue Knights. Pound Crier. Yes. What is it called? Town Crier. No. Evet, evet. <laughs> would, would the, um, for example, the film called The Governess, yeah. it, was, it, it served a, was meant to serve a sort of moral purpose, um, but might some people have simply thought, um, this is fun? And, of course. I mean, would it yes. really serve a very yes. moral purpose? I don't know. I agree. It, was it meant to really shock people so much that they would think this is very yeah. bad? Um, Absolutely. Like, any of us, like today, there are different genres, yes. different types of films, and we all perceive it in a different way. Some yeah. of us think that it's fun, some of them think, oh, it's a shame, it's a sin. So the reflections of audiences would be different, Mixed, of course. Yes. But what you target 
as a filmmaker might be in that way because Hussein Rami Gupnar, when he wrote the piece, he just wanted to give a lesson, moral lesson mm. to the readers. That's why the filmmakers chose that book. You did, know? did the governess come to a bad end? I mean, did she? Did something horrible happen to the governess at the end so that she was punished for all her flirtatious oh, yeah. behavior? <laughs> she was punished. But the film originally runs like 90 meters mm. um, and I haven't seen the original one. What we watched is only for a minute or yes. so, right? Yes. So I haven't seen the original one and I don't know um, what's in it what exactly, what happened. Yes, like that. so that's a, that's a shame for us. Um, and so I, with, along with that film, I read the book and tried to make, you know, mm. guesses. But again, I don't have the answer, but my point of view is like, uh, instead of blaming the French governess, Angèle, why don't we think on the opposite, like the five men, men <laughs> representing the values of the time, maybe? Mm -hmm. Isn't that a contrast? It's, it's, I don't know what they, the film critics of the time thought. So we have one film criticism, uh, about maybe a dating again from 1919, mm -hmm. written by this guy Arjan. So he doesn't talk about this concept of morality, but gives the details, technical details of the film, the setting, composition, acting, lighting, this and that. But at some point, like two or three sentences in, in those, he writes that, oh, the film reflects our national morality. Oh, <laughs> five Muslim men is, are doing that and you call that national morality because they shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> but the governess, French governess, is the one who is causing that for mm -hmm. them based on what we see or in the book, right? Mm -hmm. So I think at the time you could call it in that way. Again, for Binas, the same. The women, the it's the same thing. Yes, it's the same thing. But a woman with multiple yeah, lovers. So lovers. it's more likely it's an exploration of male fantasy. Of course, males are writing it. Males are directing it. Yeah. Yes. So it's a kind of outlook. Exactly. That. The subject matter is the same, but they're not thinking out of their boxes. Like, um, yes, the woman is the desire and the subject of desire, and there's realistic male gaze in there, but um, of course we, we have the view from today, yeah. right? Yeah. We need to look at the context and time. Like I said, um, most of the wealthy families were hiring these um, foreign governors and some people with the Islamic views or Turkish views, different ideologies, were against their values. They were saying, why French? let's teach them Arabic, or why yeah. Western manners. And this was visible also in the literature of the time, like Rejaid Zadeh Ekrem's novels, Araba Sevdası, or Hussein Rahm Gürpnar's novels. So this is the stereotypical theme for the time. So it's not only women, but it's the lifestyle, Western mores. That's why it's in relation to cinema becomes important, because why are films? it became more visible, right? Mm -hmm. Literacy was not high, like maybe in urban settings, yes, people were reading books, but by watching films, these type of films, I, I'm not sure how films were available, if they were available everywhere, but we think that, again, even there was no cinema theaters in Anatolia, at different settings, Murebiye was screened and Binnaz was screened, so, uh, question of morality was on the screen as yeah. well. Would you like to cross the line, by the way? Oh, yes, please. Thanks. I'll just take it. I'll just take it. I'll just take it. It's really interesting. <laughs> it's like, in a way, they were, I don't know what you think about this, but projecting feelings about their sexuality, perhaps difficulties, onto foreign agents or foreign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's like something else. Yeah, it's like defense mechanism. It's like today's Turkey, you know, all these cons conspiracies. <laughs> like how those films are cheap ones. I mean, number one, you're 
four years it was difficult to buy films and to get films from Europe. So the ones which were available were really affordable ones. Or this was a period of transition, thank you, from silent era to sound era. So Ottomans didn't really have those machines to, sh to screen sound film. So whatever was left, exactly what Rifiq Ayin says, was available in the Ottoman lands. So that's why the content of the films were in that way. Or the, like um, most of those daily newspapers describe it, like that was maybe what the audience demanded. Like they wanted to see it because it was interesting mm. and it was something different. It was something to sell, to make profit. Mm. There was mm. a clientele, not only for films, for photography, for postcards, for so many different types of ephemera. Yes. So could you give us a bit of an understanding of filmmaking in general in the Ottoman Empire? Yes. I mean, was it a highly developed industry or was it who, and who, who, were, who were making the films? Good question and a tough one. <laughs> so, number one issue is this, like, as I said at the beginning, most of the sources I use are textual sources. We don't have a national film archive and it's very difficult to reach the films themselves. So, this current government has been working on founding a national archive for 10 to 15 years. They spent money on field works and I think Finally, in 2019, they will open the archives to the uh, social scientists, film studies scholars. But most of the films that they have are located at Turkish Armed Forces Photo Film Center, Turkish Selim Photo Film Marquis. Why? I'll give you the reason, and that's connected to the filmmaking. So, as a civilian, we're not entitled to enter the military uh, grounds. If you want to see the films that they have, you need to write and they may decline your uh, application. Anyways, these are the details. So we don't know exactly how many films, what kind of films they made. The only films I was able to reach so far, like three or four fictions, but it's easier to find uh, documentaries. So with this, information I, I can talk about how filmmaking started in the empire so when it was like in 1896 one of the uh, merchants in Istanbul Istiklal Caddesi I should come to the is it okay? Um, Zygmunt Weinberg uh, wrote a petition or a letter to Sultan Abdul Hamid II asking if he could make the films of Ordu Humayun, Ottoman army. Uh, we couldn't find the answer or if he was allowed or not in 1896, 19, in 1899, 1899. But later on, there are sources reflecting that Zygmunt Weinberg made films. So he was Jewish and Savash Arslan from Bahçeşehir University made a research about him. And he, was considered by the cinema historians as the person who helped cinema to develop in the empire, right? But there is another important figure who is, do you know who he is? Enver mm -hmm. Pasha. Oh. Enver Pasha was very much interested in photography. He was himself taking photographs. Like, I read his letters to his wife, Nadia Sultan. So he goes to Germany and writes back to his wife and also puts one of his handsome pictures in the letter but says, oh, I went to Kodak, I bought this film and that. So he's very much interested in, uh, in photography. Of course, during his trips, he gets a chance to, to see what's happening in Europe. Uh, I don't have other details, but we know that during the wartime, when Ottomans allied with Germans, um, and Marcosha wanted to have what German said, which is Marquez or the Cinema Diarist, military officer, military cinema office, military cinema office, Marquez or the Cinema Diarist. That's the more or less translation. So he founded this organization under the Ministry of War, Harbi and Azarite, 
and they began to make official films there. What they were it was like wartime films mm -hmm. from battlefields, from Gelibolo, Çanakkale, or Zygmunt Weinberg was sent to European fronts like Galicia mm -hmm. and Romania to make films. He was also sent to Germany to buy films. So this unit under the military was actively involved in making films. And other soldiers like Fuad Uskuna, Jimmy Filmer, I referred to him during my talk, were trained in this institution. They were basically soldiers, but they collaborated with Austrian-Hungarians because of the war and Germans, and they learned how to use different types of um, cameras. They also learned to screen films. So Fuad Bey from Military Office of Cinema was also screening films at Mekteb Sultani, Galatasaray High School. So these are the first initial filmmakers, but later on we know that since theater was very similar to cinema, actors began to be involved in making films like Ahmed Fahim in Binnaz and Governance. He was a performer, a theatrical performer. He directed the two films. He didn't really want to do it, but he was in a way forced to do it. In his memoirs, he doesn't even talk about his experience in filmmaking, but theater plays. And later on, we have Musin Ertuğrul. He was trained in Russia and in Germany, and he founded his own production company in Germany. And then he came to, he came back to Empire. Like um, his initial films, like because it's a transition period, were under, of course, the Republic of Turkey, 1920s. And of course, there is one more person, but we don't have his films. That's why it's kind of controversial but most of the written sources refer to him Sedat Smali, journalist Hürriyet, <coughs> family of Hürriyet so Sedat Smali shot two films in 1917 Pençe and Jasus but we don't have those films, they are either they destroyed I mean, for Maybe all these... in the military yeah, still? he wasn't connected to military, he just did it independently but for this type of silent films, early films there is, this is a technical information. Uh, even for US or in European countries, most of the films are either destructed or lost. Why? Because of the chemical nature of the films. They were shot in nitrate form, which, would, which is uh, highly flammable. And they would, if you don't restore it, they would lose the color, they would cause fire. Yes, they would vanish. But we, I mean, like so many other films that we found so far, those two films of Sedat Smabi may come out one day in the future, who knows, we never know. Do the military films that were taken, do they exist in the, yes. in the military museum? Of course, they well, do. They would actually be of great interest, would they not, if they were um, examined and produced these days? Exactly. And there was, um, there's been a great deal of interest uh, in, in, in the West, Yes. In the first four films, yes. which have been yeah. um, surely um, some of these Ottoman ones will be of great interest if the can the army be persuaded to True. let them out. So this national film archive mm -hmm. I mentioned that AQP will establish. They borrowed films from Turkish armed forces, and not only from that institution, but. Uh, TRT mm -hmm. and Basın Yayın and some other ministries that Basın Yayın, Maarif Bekaleti, Bekaleti from the Republican years. So, so many other institutions house films, but they need to be integrated mm -hmm. as a location. So think, think of the interest that yes. would be shown, say, in um, Australia. And of course. That in the Gallipoli. Uh, of course. Yes. Yeah. If they were... Um, they are. Like, for instance, as you said, um, in 2015, I guess, for the for TSK, for their anniversary, they released some of these films. You mentioned, like, the visit of uh, Emperor, German Emperor Wilhelm Kaiser's trip to Istanbul, or uh, some battlefield scenes. 
not Chanakkale but others, and some of the parts of Bin Nas, they're available online. If you go to Sabah Gazette, it's the Sabah Newspapers TV, you can watch them, but they're short and they're like uh, in a, how should I say, mixed. Mm. It's not from the beginning until the end, and there is no information about what is what and which year they were made. Namely, there's no metadata. We don't know what, when, who, <laughs> right? These things. It's just up there. I worked on films uh, shot during the first four years. I'm writing an article on it, and I also presented a paper on the film called. Um, protests of Sultan Ahmed because right after the First World War the occupation took place in Izmir so there were public protests in Istanbul in Fatih, Kadıköy, Unkapana and Halid Edip was one of the speakers so I found the copy of the film in uh, US National uh, Archives in Maryland mm -hmm. um, as you said like wartime films they were used in documentaries at the time we don't know who shot the film, so I was trying to follow it. And in Turkey, TRT has several copies, but we don't know again who made it. But from memoirs, we can follow that Turks, as well as some other Ottomans and some other forces present in Istanbul, shot the protests of Sultan Ahmed. So, for instance, that's available. and. I'm writing on it, and some of the films, like you said, a colleague of mine, Saadet Özen, she's also working on cinema history, she was able to find some other films in Russian film archives, French film archives, <laughs> and New Zealand, which is funny, but, so we're waiting for this film archive in Ankara to be, you know, accessible for us. Mm. I'm sure there are so many films there. That, as they mention ribbons of films, but again, <laughs> it takes time, I guess. Mm. So, if you go to TRT's Turkish Radio Television's website, and not the website, but archives website, you can watch some of those films from First World War mm. years. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So. Does it make sense for the start of the Ottoman filmmaking? It's mainly the Ottoman officials and as well as these semi-charity organizations during the war time. Like these fictions were made by the Society of National Defense or the Mayan Gaz Najemiyeti, the Society of Disabled Veterans. Why did they make films? Because they wanted to also generate income for supporting the war cause. So they were making films, which is costly, yes, but they were selling tickets. And the ticket revenue was going to the society supporting the veterans' families or other causes. Even like uh, Hilal Ahmed Red Crescent or Society of Navy, Donama Jemiyeti was generating money from these type of events. Like so many different societies during that time were organizing events for people to support the workers buying tickets, balls or charity dinners. So the films were screened in that cause as well. Uh, we know very little about why only Autumn State, because it's again related to the finances of the time, money, interest and training. And I should also note most of the crew of the films, like technical or actors, were coming from non-Muslim backgrounds, including the actors. Um, but after the First World War, with the change of land and population, most of them emigrated. So there are sources indicating, like saying like, um, I can't remember the names, but our friends they left us. He was the only one able to use camera. Mm -hmm. Who do we have now? Such and such, this type of thing. So this is a transition of years. So it also affected filmmaking in the empire because training someone who knows to use the gadget, it takes time getting used to it. 
and cinema owners were the same. Yes, Ottoman Turks, Muslims also run theaters, cinema houses, but the numbers of the non-Muslims and foreigners is really high, especially during the war time with the uh, outbreak of uh, revolution in Soviet Russia. Most of the Russians came to Istanbul and they were really active in nightlife mm -hmm. and social activities from pianists right to actors, dancers. Um, so they opened also movie theaters, cinema theaters mm -hmm. in Istanbul. This is mainly Istanbul of course and I'm not sure if they collaborated in making films, but they were the business owners, for sure. It's what you say makes sense. I've seen albums, photograph albums, very official looking ones with the Ottoman troops in the Balkans mm -hmm. in the, exactly that period. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, I, thanks to your talk, I know now you know, where they came from, that this was an official uh, operation run by the army. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. Yeah. It's very, very useful, thank you. Sure. Mm. You, you quoted Halliday as uh, saying that um, film was for um, entertainment and uh, it was not uh, really <laughs> for polite society. But um, there was the, uh, say, the propaganda use of film exactly. in the first mm -hmm. war. And during the uh, Republic, I think, the film, there was quite a tendency to use film for education purposes. Of course. Had there been anything of that in, in the late, later years of, yes. of the Empire? Yes, thank you. This is like the years I'm moving on is kind of my expertise. I worked on Halkevleri, people's houses, mm -hmm. and how they used educational films. But as you said, propaganda, I should just go back to the previous years, as I said, um, military units started filmmaking. So their first aim was propaganda, of course. So why they made the film in Çanakkale or in Romania or Galicia? So they were making those better battlefield films, showing to students, hmm. to you know, for, yes, or for training purposes of the other soldiers hmm. who were in Istanbul. So there was a logic behind it, but. Autumn experience was very limited in comparison to like British or Germans, as they had all the raw film or you know technical materials. Ottomans were dependent on European market. In order to make films, they had to pay money. So that's one thing. But they did use films for propaganda purposes. But this was very limited. So moving to uh, Republican years, like modern Turkey. Again, uh, cinema was not directly in their agenda in the 20s until 1932. Um, and JHP, Republican People's Party, founded this um, agency called Cinema uh, Temsilleri Bölümü. And there were a number of people under it. So the party itself began to produce films. But why? They wanted to screen those films at people's houses, Halk mm -hmm. in Ankara, Halk Evi. Ankara Halk Evi was the center. So most of the films were housed by Ankara Halk Evi, based on the resources that other Halk Evi's, people's houses in Anatolia had. Some of them had projector camera, but some didn't. So they were sending the films. But not only JHP made their own films, but they purchased films from US, educational films, or from other European countries. What were they? For instance, again, they were mostly silent films. Even though it, we, were, we were talking about 30s, they didn't have enough resources to buy new machines, like with the sound mm -hmm. system, synchronized sound system. So what they were buying, my guess, my impression from the sources I gathered is they were buying the unwanted films, but educational ones. What were they, for instance, uh, about the use of uh, clean water or agricultural issues, how to plant cotton or the use of coil gas. The, the, there are these type of uh, genres based on agriculture, chemistry, or 
at schools like translations of some of the best known novels, right? They were filmed in a different way, like in a theatrical form performances. So they were used at schools for kids, students. Or what kind of films? They were making the films of their own national bayrams, like Onjil um kutlamaları <laughs> ceremonies, or Atatürk's speeches, or İsmet İnönü's speeches, or they made a collaboration with Russians and shot Türkiye'nin uh, kalbi Ankara, the heart of Turkey, Ankara. So that was also a documentary screened in different people's houses throughout Anatolia and urban centers, of course. So yes, I'm sorry, I've taken you rather no. off to later than your subject. No, no, no problem. So, I, I work on this period too, so no problem. But yes, it was more actively done during the Republican years, but after 30s and it had another break in 50s because people's houses were closed down. So they couldn't keep doing what they aimed, educating via films. They just could do it until 1950s because new party, Democrat party, demolished all of the people's houses. Some of them later became active, but JHP, the chemist ideology, was aware of the fact that films could be used for educational purposes. The crucial point would be when this archive will be ready for opening to the public. Like what's, what's, the, yeah, what's the delay? Why is it, do you think it's taking so long? I don't know. It's the bureaucracy or lack of uh, staff or I don't know. <laughs> Is there a concern about the films there? How could it be? It's like I go to British Pate online and I purchase films online. Like the you can watch them all online. Like the views from Sırkamsh during the First World War. They're expensive, crazy expensive in comparison to Turkish lira, of course. But why? I'm able to do it from foreign mm. archives, but not in Turkey. Mm. Why? I don't know, it's the mentality, it's the people, like other maybe social scientists, historians or film scholars, film scholars do, but they mainly work with textual data sources. So the use of films as a historical source is not very wide in Turkey, but it gives us a lot of a lot of information visually and Background. yes i can show you other films of istanbul from 1897 alexander promio lumiere brothers operator came to istanbul made two films about golden horn and wazichi what a big source oh, about the urban settings why don't we use that mm -hmm. yes photographs and along with photographs films can be used so we need to push the <laughs> archives Mm -hmm. management to do it we had uh, it, several times we had some sorry i was going to say that's absolutely right there's a you'll have to remind me that there's a well-known film a documentary film taken in the last year of the republic by the the the, the parisian uh Khan. Yes, Albert Khan. the Albert Khan film on turkey that's extremely yeah. interesting the years of the empire yeah. yes and photographs Yes. Photographs, yes. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, Sadek Özen, uh, a colleague of mine and friend, uh, she is doing PhD currently, but they made documentaries about Ankara and they had used resources from Albert Khan. Yeah. Yes, and this documentary was funded by Melik Gökçek, the mayor, former mayor. <laughs> so, yes. When there's no resources, we go to other archives, of course, like Saadet did. And they also made an, uh, another documentary about the start of cinema in the Ottoman Empire named Bırakın Çocuk Oynasın in 2018. So it tells the story of development of cinema in the Ottoman Empire, about first initial filmmakers, traveling operators, the f initial make initially made films, audiences, um, it's funded by TRT. Good things are happening too, but <laughs> limited. So this is a new source. They mainly used sources that, that archive had because it was funded by the Ministry of Culture, 
They shared their holdings with the filmmakers, but not with everyone. So in Turkey, we have the problem of trans transparency and accessibility of the you know institutions, film archives. They are not always very collaborative. You always need to know someone high on the top, <laughs> which is a pity. The modern techniques are able to um, revive old film, in, in yes. often in a rather extraordinary way. Exactly. I agree. Yes, I mean, it's an interesting topic for me to study. When I first started, I was a student at Boazji University, and we had Mithat Alam Film Center, founded by Mithat Alam, late Mithat Alam. And as students, we were gathering together and reading about the start of cinema in the region. Most of the sources written were by like Nijat Özön, Rekin Teksoy, John Skolomi. They were mainly generic books like saying the same thing over and over, but they were the only sources at the time in 2000s. And in the group of uh, students, I was the only one who studied history and the others were from technical departments. But what they would say always, oh, Ottomans didn't do anything again. Oh, Ottomans can't manage anything. And I was like, silently, okay, okay, I was there. I was telling myself not to say anything or not to oppose. They were praising how French made films, Lumiere Brothers, George Méliès, this and that. I was like, no, there should be something. So I decided to do my research project about Ottoman cinema. But when I began, I only used textual sources, right? And I went to my professor and I told him that, oh, I'm going to study Ottoman cinema. And he was like, he's a prominent historian, my favorite. But when I told him I'm going to study Ottoman cinema, he was like, was there Ottoman cinema? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> yes, there was. You wrote about this again, telling myself. And then I realized throughout the years, while forming my you know, research questions or my research, I was like, oh, this is an understudied topic. No one knows about it. Mm -hmm. And I call it autumn cinema, and so many people were opposing to it because how can you call it autumn cinema? I'm still formulating it, anyways. But then I went to Central European University again, doing my master's. Most of the Western European like teachers were from Western Europe and US. They were like, their first question would be this, Oh, weren't the sultan and, and imams were against films, images forbidden in you know Muslim countries? No, <laughs> that's not true. There's not only one Islam, and it's not always like that. So again, I wasn't telling or confronting with them, but when I was getting all these questions, everything, it was like telling me some things, right? That's why um, people's reactions are also or their questions shaping my own interests in a different way, but I'm again trying to be independent and shape my own ideas and try to reflect what the archives show me. Like most of the people think that, oh, women were not, oh, two women were not allowed to go to the movies. No, there's only one source or two sources and they reflect the fact that there was no official rule or regulation making women not go to the movies, right? There's no such a thing. It's like today, people did act against what it was told them, but it was something new. And Ottomans tried to catch up with the others, like in Europe or other places. They were interested in it. They wel they welcomed films. They were surprised by their. If you look at what I had in the slides, yes, their first experiences, initial experience was mixed with surprise and shock, but it was the same in Russia, it was the same in US. So, yeah, for me, this topic is fascinating and I'll keep working on it. <laughs> it's my passion. Well, early movies must have been magical or almost scary, yeah. really, must have been. Well, the, the experience, That's like that experience of, of, of the 40-year-old woman, yes. But then yeah, there were the corresponding understand. experiences in, in, the, in the States when the first film was shown on, I think, of a train. Yes, train, oh, yes, the same. Is not, and uh, people thought that yeah. they were going to be yeah. run over. Yeah. Yes, that's the same in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I refer to that in my <coughs> other talks. Mm -hmm. That's called train effect, like you said. Arjumant Ekran 
I had his picture in the slides. He, he, he says that some of his friends wanted to leave the venue. Mm. They were shocked, but they kept sitting. So it's the same thing. Or you said magical, mm. like Maxim Gorky has a piece about his first experience of watching a film. So he calls it magical experience. But the same thing can be seen in Turkish sources. Like uh, I didn't include it here because of the theme, but Ayşe Osmanov, Abdul Hamid's daughter, writes about it. At Yildiz Palace, there was film screening, and she says most of the people, of course royal people, from Harem and uh, Abdul Hamid's uh, family, they were interested in films, and they found it very interesting. And uh, Ayşe Osmanov says that curiosity kept going, so the court jester, Bertrand, kept showing more films, more and more. And Abdul Hamid himself was also interested in performing arts and cinema as well. So not only in public for people, like the ordinary audience, but also the palace was interested in films themselves. That was another topic that I gave a lecture at UCL on Tuesday, Salton and Cinema. Mm -hmm. Yes, magic. <laughs> interest in film. I mean, yes. He, he said that he, he was interested in starting the opera in Agra because he had seen it in some years. Mm -hmm. Was he, was there any sort of he was. Um, influence of a cinema yeah, in his activity? He did. Like I mentioned Hussein Atul shortly. So the first films that were made during the Turkish period was in reference to American one, but Birth of a Nation, Bir Millet Uyanıyor. So that film is half fiction and half documentary. And written by the script was written by Nazif Çanlıbel, but in some sources it is reflected that Atatürk retold him this story so he could write it. And Atatürk himself provided uh, some of the costumes, even his own, for the soldiers in the film, high rank soldiers. And he also uh, asked the uh, military to help the making of the film because there are reenactments, re reenactments. And he, like Jimmy Finmer also mentions that he was going to the film screenings and that's why Jimmy Finmer, as I said, uh, he said the first uh, mixed gender film screening took place in his mood because Atatürk was there. So he made everyone sit all mixed. This is what he wrote, film I wrote in his memoir. It made it through. So Atatürk goes to a film screening in his mood and asks everyone to sit mixed. So without segregation. But as I said, there was those type of film screenings before Atatürk. So here and there, there are some pieces, of course, most of those 10th year anniversary or JHP's uh, official ceremonies, we see Atatürk talking in the films. Americans, the ambas ambassador of US, I can't remember his name right now, but they have sources of Atatürk, the films of Atatürk, like, which is not available online, but they have separate films. And when Iran, Shah of Iran comes, to Ankara, there are films of Atatürk and uh, Shah of Iran in Ankara and in Istanbul. And in one part, you can watch it online. Atatürk is so elegant and polite. So he talks to Iran Shah, the Shah of Iran, and then he takes off his hat and his Yaver, um, Yaver service assistant. assistant is next to Atatürk, but he's like, Buyurun Efendim. Yeah, but he's like so polite and t telling his assistant, servant, uh, Efendim, any Buyurun Efendim. He's just passing his hat to him. He, he, he, he, he doesn't have to address him like that, but he's so nice in the t film, throughout the film. I don't know, I like to watch that one. Where can you see that one? On YouTube, Iran Shahı if you just search like that, and they speak in Azeri Türkçesi, like uh, Iran Shah, he, he speaks Azeri Türkçesi and Atatürk speaks like mm -hmm. but they can communicate, you can see it. Yes, it's so interesting to see that in the film. Yes. Rulers of Turkey and Iran are not always the same. Uh, 
Yeah, time to die. Atatürk made some difference, I guess. <laughs> Well, that was really most interesting. Yes. Thank you. It was very enjoyable for me.